So from my side, all the fathers, uh, we really do appreciate you. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about men. And uh, the challenges, not the challenges, but how to be a man. And uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into that a little bit this morning. Good. So uh, are you ready for another half an hour quickly? We will be done by uh, 10.30. I've paced myself this time, so I won't go that far over the time like I did last Sunday. But we're going to share the Word of God with you. Um, so, so from my side, first of all, Happy Father's Day. And, uh, and I include when I say that, sorry, let me just say this quickly. My, some of you might see in the front row, there's a big plaster on my side of my head here. This happened before Father's Day. Marriage is tough. not always easy you, you don't reach 36 years of marriage without any scars a left hook is a terrible thing no <laughs> i had some surgery done so i can come back to my handsome self at the age of 60. so uh, so there's nothing serious so we are sort that i'm just saying that putting it out there for people who are wondering maybe she did give me a left hook or something it was not her it was the doctor so that out of the way now so we are we are good to go hallelujah um, so when I speak this morning I'm not going to speak to fathers only physical biological fathers I want to speak to men in general and I want to speak to the ladies as well so you can understand a few things about men um, how God created men I'm just gonna kind of throw a few th few things out there so when I say talk about fathers I also want to say happy Father's Day to fathers who have stepped in as stepfather step in when father somebody else stepped out uh, people who who father people spiritually and emotionally who is there for other people there's many like that i think about godfrey for instance he's absolutely a father to a young lot of young kids uh, in the hostel and in our youth and i want to say thank you to people like that who says i will give of myself even to children that is not my children i will give myself and I want to thank and honor you as well for the way that you give, the way that you teach, the way that you are available emotionally and to give guidance and direction uh, just by a word in season, by encouraging, by uplifting uh, others. So thank you for you guys. Now, I heard something that Kit said that my dad is so old that when he went to school, um, history that we have today was called current affairs at that time. And uh, this little story I've told a few times. I'm going to say a few things that some of you might have heard before in the church. Um, I'm going to tell a story that some of you have heard before just now. But I love this story about the kid who comes to his father and he's asking his dad about creation. Where do we come from? How have we been made? And the father tells him about creation. God made us and God created us in his image. And the little boy runs into the house and he, he meets up with his mom. He asks his mom, where, does, where do we come from? How, how, how did this happen, that man, that we are here? And his mom tells him the story about evolution, that we were evolved from the monkeys and we became... So the little boy is a bit confused. He goes back to his dad and he asks his dad. And he says, Dad, I don't know. I don't understand. You said God created us. Mom says we evolved from the monkeys. Who's right? And the dad, in his wisdom, <laughs> I declare already knows the answer. And the dad, in his wisdom, says, No, no, no. I spoke about my family and your mom spoke about her family. <laughs> so we are both right. So we are both right. Hallelujah. When, when a kid is six years old, he will say, my dad knows everything. When he's 10 years old, he will say, my dad knows a lot. When he's 14 to 16 years old, he says, my dad knows nothing. <laughs> when he's a teenager. But then at 21 again, he says, my dad knows a few things. And at age 30, he says, let's go ask dad. He will know what to do. And then at age 40, you say, I wish my dad was here, that I could ask him, but he's not here anymore. So let us appreciate it. It's the seasons of life. It's fine. It's okay. That's the way it is. So I'm going to give you a few stats quickly. Statistics says that where a family serves God with a father and a mother coming to church, bringing the kids to church, like I see some of the families do here, when they do that, father, mother, kids come to church leading the way. 75% chance that those kids, 75% of those kids will do exactly the same. 
They will come to church. They will lead their families to church when they grow up. When it's only the mother and the father is not a father, it's a fatherless home, or the father stays at home, he's not involved in it at all, that figure drops to 23%. Chance of kids that will actually follow. They won't necessarily follow mom to church, but they will follow dad to church. 75% compared to 23%. Fatherless homes is something very common in the time that we are living. So um, the statistics, I'm going to give you only three, there's way more than this. But 90% of teen runaways that run away from home to go and live on the streets, 90% of them come from a house where there's no father in their house. 80% of rapists come from a fatherless house. 85% of people in prison come from a fatherless home. So what I'm saying is that fathers, you are so important. You are the ones who give direction and bring stability into the house. God has appointed fathers to be that in the house, to bring the stability and the direction in the house now the problem that we have is that so many fathers today and it's probably so many of you sitting here come from fatherless homes honestly people who, who were brought up without a dad or an absent dad or a dad was not interested at all grew up in that environment and then you get married and now you become a father yourself with no frame of reference of how to do this and then we kind of do it with trial and error we miss it and we make mistakes and we we we're trying our best to be there but without that, that, uh, that history that somebody taught us how to do it. So the thing is this, when we look at fathers, we can often think, why do they miss it? Why do they, why do they do these stupid things? Often in life, we just don't know how. We just do the best with what we, what we can do with what we have. Because many fathers grow up without a good example of what it is to be, um, to be a father so if you grew up in a home where there was a mom and a dad and you were the kids and it was a beautiful family and you did life together as a family you are very blessed you are actually very rare because in today's society we don't find that anymore so much we don't we don't and uh, you are very blessed and you are very rare now what i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pull the curtain away a little bit this morning with men so that we can understand them a little bit better i don't know if ladies know this but men are way more sensitive to rejection than women think when men are emotionally and sexually rejected they draw back and they close up it's a fact when they are emotionally and sexually rejected they i'm talking about in general they draw back they become quiet they don't talk about it so the thing is this, men don't talk about the stuff that bothers them. Men kind of just keep it for themselves. Now this week, this past week, I was so surprised that in my inbox, in my um, emails, I received an email from the men's uh, mental health clinic. I don't know where they come from. It just put in my envelope, in, opened it up, start reading. Wow, was I surprised when I started reading statistics about men. Now this month, June, is uh, Men's Mental Health Month. So August is Women's Month. So we have decided that June is Men's Month. <laughs> we are taking it. Can I have an amen from the guys? Yeah. It's Men's Month. Where it's Father's Day, we have Men's Month. You can have Women's Month later on in August. So listen to this quickly. This was a total eye-opener for me. Listen to this. The stats that the Mental Men's Health Clinic released, it says this. On average, in South Africa, 16 men will commit suicide every day. I didn't know that. I thought it cannot be right. And then I started thinking about Henny, how many men do I know? Quite a few men who have committed suicide. I think, my goodness, 16 per day in South Africa? Men, and then listen to this statistic. Four out of five people that commit suicide are men. So if five commit suicide, four of them are men. Listen to this statistic. This is from the men's uh, health clinic statistics they released this week. With men under 45 years old, men under 45, the second most common cause of death under, with men under 45 is suicide. Second most cause likely cause of death for men under 45 is suicide i did not know that i was so shocked and then i thought why is this what's happening and then i realized men is way more under pressure than people think 
Because with the, total, the climate at the moment in our country, in the world, men are being badmouthed, even on social media and on news outlets and all over the world. Men are kind of badmouthed. That men are bad, men are unreliable, men are not good. And the thing is this, it's, it's with the rise of feminism that masculinity had to be pushed down. But the truth of the matter is this, one does not have to be pushed down for the other one to be lifted up. We do not have to badmouth men to say that women are great. We can say all creation of God is great. Because God created us all. We do not have to do this to uplift the other one. It's not a battle to, to be at the top. No, there's room for everybody at the top. We don't have to fight one another to be there. Now, uh, men are truly under attack because generally it has been like this, that the man is the provider in the house, he gets a job, he looks after his family, and he can provide for his family. That roles have changed so much. And the men are struggling to find work. The business are struggling. That's just things that push men to feel like they don't have a purpose. And they are struggling to, to fulfill that uh, role that they are playing. Now, the, the problem is this. It happens so often that uh, I think why men would commit suicide more than ladies is because women speak way easier than men about their problems. Almost every lady has a, has a, has a lady friend. And they talk about everything that comes up in their minds. They talk about the dog and the cat and the what and the what and everything. So everything just comes out. <laughs> so the other day my wife asked me, are you listening to me? Because she's just going, on, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> she said, are you listening? And then she, she asked me, can I talk? I said, you can talk as much as you like. If I listen, it's another talk case completely because that's another story completely. But you can just talk. It's going to make you feel better. Just let it out, baby. <laughs> The thing is that women, that's how they cope. And I think it's so amazing that women can have that ability to just cope that way. Men, on the other hand, we don't do it that way. We kind of keep it bottled up. We keep quiet. We kind of work things out internally. Women work it out externally. They put it out there. And when they've put it out there, ah, they feel so good. Yeah, that's why you live to be this age and you are so healthy. It's unfair. Now, uh, men just don't do that in general. Um, if you would go to a braai and there's five or six couples and you will find the men standing around the campfire, the fire, and the lady sitting inside the house and they're having a chat. And uh, by the end of that evening and you eat together and you go home and you drive home in the car, and you will find that uh, the lady will say to you, the wife will say, oh, did you know this? And then she will tell you the whole conversation. <laughs> about everything that was said around that conversation and like what and then she will ask you the inevitable question so what did you guys talk about around the fire and the answer will be nothing <laughs> no you could not have spent an hour around the fire you spoke nothing and then the guy will go like um just what did we talk about i can't really remember because we don't kind of remember I remember that, ladies, another one you, what you, that you don't understand probably is that when you're driving with your husband and he's driving, it's happened with us numerous times, drive from Pretoria, I, it, it becomes quiet in the car. So I'm just sitting there driving and then all of a sudden she will just look at me and say, what are you thinking? <laughs> like I'm thinking, what am I thinking? I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what was I just thinking? And I'm just, nothing. And she goes, you can't think nothing. What were you thinking? No, really, nothing. I was thinking nothing. So for the girls out there, we don't understand men. Men has the ability to think about absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's an amazing blessing that we have. We can truly think about nothing. But it's a kind of a panic mode that sets in because you can't remember what you were thinking. You kind of think, what will the answer be? Because she wants to know, but then you don't know. Really, you don't know, because we really were not thinking about anything. And that is stuff that ladies don't understand always. Now, uh, we, we, are, we, we handle things differently. I'm, I'm sharing this with you. I just want our girls to understand our guys a little bit better. Really. And uh, masculinity is under attack. And I want to say to the guys out there, be a man. 
Don't make apology for who you are. God created you. When, when people are called up for warfare, it's the men that go. When people are called up to protect, it's the men that protects. God has called us to be men. That's where he made us stronger. God made men in a way that we can think way more logic than a woman. Women think emotionally. The emotions that they feel is what comes up. That's why God created us as logic thinkers, way more than women. God created us to give direction with logic, with thinking, with applying principles. And let us be that man that God has called us to be. Let us be that healer, that protector. Uh, many times in our marriage, uh, when my wife experienced stuff, she will just say how she feels. And I will just bring her back to reality and say, my baby, it's not exactly how you feel. Let's just look at how it is. And when we bring reality back into the picture, then it has a complete new meaning. God has called us to be that. God has called us to bring calm in the storm. Not to create the storm, but to bring calm in the storm. To bring that balance back to the women in our lives. Now I remember years ago, we were in ministry already, young pastors in Namibia and Oranyamunt. And um, we were busy um, in the house and, and a bit of an a argument started. We were having a bit of words. And uh, I said something, and I can't remember until this day what I said, but I said something and it triggered something with my wife, like she went completely ballistic. And like, whoa, who's this woman? Where's my wife? And who are you? And who's this woman? She overreacted completely. So, whoa, calm, whoa, calm down, calm, calm. So we went down and we sat down and said, why did that trigger you what I said? And she said these words. She said, you know, when you said that, I heard my dad's voice. It brought back a flood of emotions through me. The same rejection that I've received from my dad, my whole upbringing, I felt when you said that thing. And I said, whoa, well, let us talk about this. So I remember we sat on the bed and we spoke about this thing that she was sharing with me. How she, as a little girl, she was always trying to be uh, acceptable to her dad. But she had an older sister that was always the dad's favorite. So point I want to make this morning, if you are a parent, don't have favoritism in your house. Don't have favoritism where the one child is favored above the other child. You are causing rejection in the life of that one. That is not the favorite one, not the clever one, not the best at this and the best at that. And that's what happened with her. She was the second one, and the sister was the favorite of the dad. And, and, and she said to me, when I grew up, I always wanted my dad's attention. I actually became a bit of a tomboy because she would carry the tools for her dad. She would climb into the roof with her dad to do stuff with him because she just wanted acknowledgement that I'm also here. Please see me too. And then when we grew up and we got married, uh, something happened. The dad was, uh, then he would be drinking and then he would be serving God and then he would be cheating and then he would be faithful. It was just his life. And finally, mom and dad divorced and we lost contact with her father. So when we, so I actually said to her, I don't want anything to do with him because what he's done with you and with your mom and everything. So we broke contact with her father. So at that point in time, she didn't even know where her father was. Uh, they didn't have contact. He would only make contact with her sister once again. And the sister was the favorite one. And we sat on that bed. It was a morning of healing on that bed when we sat there because we tried to start to dissect why is her dad like this? And this revelation is going to come to somebody here this morning. Why is her dad like this? And we realize that dad is like this because he's just an idiot. No, it can't be. He can't just be an idiot. He's a result of his upbringing. You see, this is the thing. Everybody is a result of what happened with them. Everybody, all of us, is a result of what happened with us. And we can only give what we have. If what you have is rejection, that is what you will be giving, is rejection. But if you heal from your rejection, you can give love and you can give acceptance. And that is why we need to heal from our past. We can't give what we don't have. And we realized that morning our boys are still small. They are only in grade one and two and three. They are somewhere there. And if we don't heal from that today, we will, she will give rejection to the boys. To the kids, if she doesn't heal you. And we started dissecting her father's life. And we realized her dad grew up in a, in a pastor's house. Her dad grew up, his father was a pastor. And his father uh, only worried about the church. The, the, the family was like really on the back burner. And all those kids, 
almost every single one of them don't go to church as grown-ups. They don't, they don't like the full gospel church because the full gospel church stole their father. It was everything in his life. So they were the neglected group, and all of them said, I don't want. So her father, when he grew up, he started drinking after school. And when he was not forced to go to church anymore. And that was the route that he went. And, the, and, the, and we realized if we don't heal from this, if she cannot forgive her father, she will bring that over to her kids. And you know the bad news is when we started thinking about her father, how he grew up, and how he was rejected continuously by his father, the, the feeling on the inside of us changed to we feel sorry for him. The, 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 not hatred, but that resentment that we had changed to, oh wow, he was just a product of his upbringing. And, the, and, the, and it made the forgiveness easier to say, Lord, we forgive him. She said, I forgive my father for always rejecting me. But then we phoned my mother-in-law and I asked her, tell me about grandfather, his life. Why would he, as a man of God, reject his children like this? And when we heard that story, wow, we just realized what I'm telling you now is absolutely the truth. Because what happened with her grand, with father's father, at 17 years of age, he committed his life to Jesus. He went to a tent crusade, become born again that day, that night. He came back home. His parents were not serving God. He told his parents that night as he walked into the house, I became born again tonight. I'm the happiest boy alive. I'm 17 years old. It's just great. I met Jesus. His father asked him, what rubbish is this? He said, I became, where were you? I was at the tent crusade down the road and I was born again tonight. I, I met Jesus. He said, we don't do that rubbish. Take your stuff and get out of my house. His dad rejected him that day, that night. He had to leave the house. He never spoke to his dad again. Ever. His dad died without speaking to him again. Somebody picked him up, took him into the house. He, they sent him to Bible college. He became a pastor. So church and uh, that life was all he had. He received that rejection. And that is what he passed on to his son again. And the bad news is when we don't heal from what hurt us, we will bleed on people that did not cut us. That is the truth. And we have to heal from what damaged us. Because if we don't do it, we will bleed on our children and our wives and our sisters. And they didn't do anything to us. Because we didn't heal. The problem with us as men is we don't talk about these things. In fact, we don't even know how to internalize these things. We don't know how to handle these things. So now that we just act in ridiculous ways. So the point is this. We need to heal from what hurt us. To be truly that man of God that God wants us to be. And, uh, and if I look in, if we go to the word of God now, obviously we're going to get into God's word as well. I'm not going to be preaching without sharing God's word. Because the story that we have is, is, is such a beautiful one. D did you know that the thing that men need the most from ladies, what men desire the most is to be respected. Men would like to be respected. And uh, then they just absolutely blossom. A father will be his daughter's first love. And his son's first hero. There will be many heroes after him. There will be many other loves. But a daughter, a father will be his first love. And the son will be, he will be his son's first hero. I'm going to take you to the word of God just now. I just want to say this first. If you grew up with an abusive upbringing, you can break the pattern. You don't have to continue in it. If you grew up with an absent father, you can break the pattern. You can decide, I'm not going to do that. If you grew up with a drunk father, you can break the pattern. If you grew, grew up with a cheating father, you can break the pattern. We can do that. We can do this. So, in Judges chapter 6, I'm not going to put scriptures on the board this morning. I want to tell you the story. In Judges chapter 6, we have the people of God, the Israelites, once again, Far away from God, worshiping Baal, not serving God. The Philistines have come and they are ruling the country. They are, they are hurting them. So we pick up the story. There's no leader in Israel. And there's a man with the name of Joaz. And Joaz had a son uh, with the name of Gideon. 
Now, they were a very small family in a very small clan. They were not significant at all, no, no great people. And uh, Joaz had an altar in his backyard built for Baal, the, the idol Baal. He had a tree trunk built high up and carved images into that, and they would worship this wooden image. And they will bring sacrifice on the altar for Baal, for this wooden image that they are worshiping. They forgot about God, the almighty God that brought them through to where they are at that stage in their lives. And then the story is beautiful. I want you to go and read it, Judges chapter 6. Then the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon as he was busy threshing weed in the wine press. Now he had no business doing in the wine press because the wine press was meant for grapes. And the, but there was no grapes. So he's hiding away in the wine press with a bit of weed that he got from the field because the Philistines would come every time on his harvest and they will come and steal the harvest and take the harvest for themselves. So they were hungry. So he gathered some and now he's hiding away from the Philistines threshing the weed so they can have flour to make some bread. So while he's busy there doing the, the hiding and the threshing of the weed, the angel of the Lord appears to him. But the words of the angel is, the Lord is with you mighty man of valor he was not a mighty man of valor at all because he haven't done anything like a mighty man of valor but in the eyes of the lord he is a mighty man of valor and i want to say to every single man here this morning it doesn't matter if you are hiding away at this moment doing what you are doing god sees you and God knows you. And God is saying to you that you are a mighty man of valor. And he has placed everything on the inside of you to rise up as a mighty man of valor. At that stage, he was not acting as a mighty man of valor. But every seed was in him as a mighty man of valor. It just had to have the opportunity to come out. So then he says to him, mighty man of valor. He, he, says, he said, whoa. You must have the wrong address because I'm the smallest in my family. My family is the smallest in our clan. My clan is the smallest in the whole of Israel. We are nobodies. I'm going to just tell you the story. You can go read the story at home. And then he starts with excuses. And then the angel says, well, I want you to deliver Israel. He says, I'm a nobody. You can't expect me to be somebody because nobody will even listen to me. And then he says to him this, he says, the first thing you need to do is, you need to go and break down your father's altar. You need to chop that wooden image down. That's what you need to do. And then you need to bring a sacrifice for the Lord. Make a fire with that on the altar for the Lord. So what happens is, he says, but I can't do that. He says, that is the root out of your, your situation. You have to break down what your father has built. That altar, that wooden image. And you see the thing is this. Often in life, we think we, can, we, we can't, or let me say this. We cannot always build on what our fathers built. You have to become your man. You have to become your family. You must raise your children. In a way that God wants. If your father was worshipping ancestors, it doesn't mean you must worship ancestors. If your dad used to go to the Sangoma for her help, you do not go to the Sangoma. You go to God for your guidance. Hello? So that's what he then does. He breaks it down. I'm not going to go into that part of the story. But that was what was needed so he can become his own man. And that's exactly what he then does. He, he, he does not build on what his, father, his father's um, example was. He built on what God is saying to him to do. And then he starts building from there. And then it's beautiful because what he does then is, this man, Gideon, smallest in the tribe, nobody in the family, he is a nobody. But God says to him, I don't care what you, listen to this, what you think of you, it's because of what I think of you that is important. So he starts with excuses. In fact, the angel ignores every excuse of his. Ignores it flat. He just says, God will help you. God is on your side. God will give you guidance. God will protect you. God will lead you. The focus is taken away from him and is simply placed on God. Yes, but I am. It's not about you. It's about who God is. It's about what God can do with you and in you and through you. That's what it's all about. So, he goes and he blows the trumpet and he makes a call for war. I mean, this guy who is a nobody decides, okay, I'm going to be faithful. Starts listening to God. And then doubt sets in again because it happens. And God says to him, no, no, don't doubt. 
and God show him, I'm with you. Doubt sets in the second time. God says, don't worry, I'm with you in this. Because you see, in this journey of trying to do the right thing, we often start to doubt, can I do this? Am I good enough? Did God really say to me, because I'm not that amazing guy. Because we know our own shortcomings. We know our own flaws. We know our own mistakes. God also knows it. God knows how many times you've missed it. How many times you've made commitments and you did not keep it. God knows all of those things. But he still calls you a mighty man of valor. He still says, I want to do something great in you and through you to the people around your life. That's what I want to do. And Gideon goes and he blows a trumpet. 32,000 guys rise up and show up for the war. I mean, that's a lot of people. How did, I mean, how even did something like this happen? He was not a well-known guy in the, con, no, in the land. Nobody knew him. He was insignificant. Blows the trumpet because of what God said to him. And God stirs up the people. 32,000 shows up. God says to him, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no. I want people to know this is me doing this work. So they can brag later it was them. Tell every man who's afraid he can go back home. He says, okay guys, everybody who's afraid you can go back home. What? 22,000 of them go home. Okay, I didn't mean that guys, come on. 10,000 remain. So Gideon must have thought, okay, whoa, whoa, now we are, we are 10,000, not a lot of guys. The Philistines are thousands upon thousands. God says to him, still too many. Take them to drink water. I will show you who's, I'm going to go into that detail. But after that water drinking episode, he says, send those guys back. The other 9,700, send them back. Only 300 remains. And God says, with these guys, I'm going to do a miracle. You see, it's not about how many. It's about who God is in the battle. It's not about the, the multitudes, if they are right or wrong. It's about you and your relationship with God. Then we are in victory. Then we are on the winning side when we have Him in our lives. So this morning, I want to challenge every single guy, every man in this house, not only fathers, every man, if you are 18 and over and you are a male, then you're a man. And I want to, you're not a boy anymore, you're a man. And I want to challenge you this morning to say, yes, I'm going to rise up and I will... I will, I will destroy the altar of my father if I need to, if he had a ball altar, if he was a drunkard or a cheater or a whatever. I'm not going to continue on his, on his pathway. I'm going to choose God's pathway. You know the story about there's an alcoholic father who had two boys. I told it the other day. The alcoholic father had two sons. And uh, when these sons grew up, they spoke to both sons. The one became a total alcoholic. The other one would not even touch alcohol. And they asked the alcoholic son, so why are you a drinker? He said, that's the example my father said. Set. They asked the other one, why don't you drink? He said, that's the example my father said. I saw the devastation. This one decides he will use it as an excuse to also go that route. And this one said, I don't ever want to go that route because I saw what it did. You see, you and I can choose. Are we going to carry on with Baal worship on the altar of Baal? Or will we become people who say, a buck stops with me. My children will be raised up in a family that serves God. And I as a man, as a father, I will be in that family. I will bring them to church. I will guide them. I will bring guidance. We can choose that. I'm coming towards the end. Hallelujah. So what did Gideon do? I've just written down three points here. First of all, what did he do? He believed God. Point number one, Gideon believed God. In the beginning, he couldn't understand what he was saying, but he believed God that he is a mighty man of valor. And every man here this morning must understand you are a mighty man of valor. Second thing he did was to break down the altar of his, and the image that his father built. And he made a decision to say, I will not worship Baal, Baal because my father did. I will not abuse because my father did. I will not abandon because my father did. I will not cheat because my father did. I will not be that what my father did. And then the third thing he did was he took action. Then he called the men up and the men came. And things started to change. The thing is this, you are not a victim of your past. You are the author of your own future. And there's a warrior in every single one of you. 
And I'm calling upon that warrior to arise. There's a warrior in you. I'm calling upon that warrior to arise and say, you know what? I will make a decision to serve the Lord. I will make a choice to put God first in my life so that when I have God first, my family, save my family to follow me. Is there any men like this in this house today that want to say, you know what? I want to arise as a mighty man of valor. Even if you've committed your life to Jesus, you are serving God, I just want you to stand where you are if you want to arise as a mighty man of valor. Rise up and say, I want to serve God. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be great. You have to be a nobody. You don't have to be anything great. But rise up as a mighty man of valor and, be a, and, and make the decision to say, you know what? I want to serve God. I want to put Him first. I'm going to pray for you guys who are standing. And today, make a decision to say, yes, Lord. I want to serve you with everything that I have. Amen? Let us pray together. Father God, I thank you for every man that is standing at this very moment. Every man who is watching online. I pray, Father God, you will absolutely do an amazing work in us. This morning, we might not see that we are mighty men of valor. But because you say it, we believe it. Because you see something in us, we were going to move with you, Father, and trust you. And therefore, this morning, I pray, Lord God, every man that is standing right now, that you will just come and do an amazing work in their lives, in their families, in their business, in whatever they do, Father God, that they will, it, it will be evident in their lives that they are mighty men of valor, rising up to become everything that you want them to become, Father God. I speak a blessing over them, over their children, over their wives, over their families, everything that's pertaining to them, Father God. I speak a blessing over them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy Father's Day. May the Lord bless you. Pastor Quivers, you're going to close in prayer for us and uh, release the people. Remember those people who are here for the very first time, join us for coffee. And I uh, would love to see you guys in the hall as well. Amen. Thank you.